Hello, um, I'm uh, very pleased um, to um, start off the um, Occupational Psychiatry uh, Special Interest Group um, webinar. This is our first one. My name is Neil Greenberg and it's uh, a delight um, to have hopefully a lot of people here. I have to say I don't quite know how many, but um, I know there were people queuing up to start off with. So hopefully um, that's a that's a good thing. Um, we've got um, a fabulous afternoon, hopefully. We've got three uh, speakers and we'll have um, excellent uh, time for questions at the end. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to briefly introduce the speakers and then I'm going to uh, dip out and let them speak in turn and I'll come back at the end. You will find a question and answer um, box um, if you um, move your cursor around and I would strongly encourage you to uh, put in any questions that you want to ask whenever you want to ask them. And at the end, I will act as a compare um, to try and uh, make sure that um, the, the questions, as many as we can, uh, get answered by our panel. So today we're speaking about health anxiety in the workplace. Um, and uh, the first speaker is uh, going to be Dr. Philip Johnson, who is a consultant occupational physician. Uh, he spent 18 years in the army um, as an aviation medicine specialist. Um, and has done lots of very interesting work since then, including working for Goldman Sachs um, and now does individual casework. Uh, and I've worked with Phil a number of times, uh, particularly on uh, emergency services uh, work. Next up, we have uh, Dr. Nick Gray, who's a consultant clinical psychologist. Um, Nick and I worked um, on the PTSD guidance um, redevelopment for, for NICE, uh, but he's done a, a whole host of really excellent stuff. Uh, many years he was the Joint Clinical Director at the Centre for Anxiety Disorders and Trauma at uh, South London and the Maudsley. And he is also a member of the Welcome Anxiety Disorders Group uh, based uh, in Oxford. Uh, and Nick's done a lot of great work and is going to be speaking, as you can see, about anxiety. And then last, but by no means least, we've got uh, Dr Dan Sherwood. Um, Dan currently works at uh, Stanford Hall, which is the Defence Medical uh, Rehabilitation Centre. Dan's a psychiatrist and served in the Royal Air Force for lots of years um, and um, will be speaking on functional impairment. Um, so I will now opt out and hopefully allow everybody to get on and do their bits. OK, so I think that's me gone. So over to, um, to you, Phil, for the, the first presentation. Good. I hope people can hear me just... There we go. So I'm here intending to talk about the anxious employee and really set the scene for the, the guys that are following me. So that is me. We live in interesting times. We don't have a rule book anymore. Our reliance upon evidence seems to be limited. There's not a lot of it about. Hard to work out what's right and what's wrong. Uh, it's uncertainty is, as we all know, a powerful cause of anxiety. Anxiety may be understandable, it may be something else, it may be many things. Whether we call it irrational, idiosyncratic, situational, all might apply, but uh, we are dealing with difficult situations. So, return to work. Why do we actually distinguish, it's a question that often strikes me, why do we distinguish between returning from leave, maternity, illness, bereavement and all the other things? And now we have returning from furlough or not from furlough, which is even worse and all the problems that may go with that. Returning to work creates its own problems and people are very often uh, anxious about returning to work. Many, many of us will have experienced the, uh, the, the problem of coming back after two weeks of what was supposed to be leave and the immediate feeling is one of tiredness and what am I doing here? Uh, how many people say I've had two weeks off and I feel as if I need a holiday? So any return is an obstacle. Some are lucky enough to enjoy their work, but most are not. And it's a common point that concerns do not improve with being away from work. So what are the key variables in a return? Well, there's health status. That might be COVID related. That's not directly what we're here to talk about today. There's pre-existing anxiety related. And then there are the situational ones, the matters of the moment, the problems of today. We know that minimizing the length of an absence will improve the chance of a successful return. 
but we also know that there's not a lot we can do about that at the present time. So we really have the situation that presents itself as the major variable in the occupational health approach to these situations. And one of the problems that we have is one of anticipation, and that is, what is it that awaits you when you reach the office? What are your anticipations? What are you fearing? Many people have a prior poor absence history, attendance issues, performance problems. There are the interpersonal issues that go with being in the office. And few of these, if any, will have improved by 16 weeks away from work. We will have all come across people who are much better, they feel, having had three months off work with their problems, whether they be uh, physical health, mental health related, and they come back to us as occupational physicians in particular and say, it's fine, I'm better. And within two or three weeks of being back, of course, they're not better and they never were. So the problems that people were experiencing before they went off for, um, for furlough or whatever are not going to have improved over the intervening period. What are the reasons that people are off? Well, there are many reasons that people are going to be worried about coming back or putting forward their worry about coming back. These include I'm shielding my medical condition and I've come across many um, relatives and uh, and friends and um, and employees who are holding up their relatively minor medical condition as a reason for shielding. Uh, mother partner, the cat is shielding. I don't trust my colleagues to behave safely. I work with people who I wouldn't trust at the best of times and now I can't. They work and not providing the correct masks, gloves, whatever it might be. I have a disability. Any number of reasons I'm hearing at the moment for I can't go back to work. Um, obviously, it's a risk assessment process. Many of us are involved in advising on those who may or may not be able to go back to work. I would have, for those who haven't come across it, mention the COVID age risk assessment process, which is if you can't find it anywhere else available on the Alamo website. Um, but assessing people's ability to return to work is a complex process and there's a lot of anxiety around those issues. In addition, we've had people off for all of these weeks with the pressures of home. Uh, we've, a lot has been spoken on the media about the problems that occur with people being at home, the increased level of interpersonal difficulties in the home. Working from home, I've heard many people talking about how wonderful it is. Um, my feeling is that that's a very middle class view of life and where you're living in a small space with lots of neighbours who are noisy with the family on furlough as well and the children at home from school, uh, limited, uh, limited space. Some of the family up late watching box sets, other people expected to be at their computer at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, it's really not that easy. There are job security concerns, work concerns. Um, we need to try to understand the issues, and I think this is what we'll be coming back to a lot. Try to understand what is affecting somebody and not necessarily what they're saying. I don't feel safe at work. There are many people who are going to come back and say, I don't feel safe at work. I don't feel able to be there. Um, that's a question of perception. The Employment Rights Act does actually allow somebody who truly feels unsafe at work to refuse to go in. Um, where this is born out of anxiety rather than a, a, an actual reason, we have a difficulty which can be a problem both for employee and employer. So assessing these situations needs to take into account the reaction of the individual, the background to it, and therefore a meaningful understanding of what's actually going on. So what is the problem with anxiety? Well, that really is a how long have you got question. We have the individual's perspective and we don't reasonably expect insight in these circumstances. People have been reading a lot. A lot has been said. Some of it's accurate, some of it's not. Um, and some of it, some people will get everything they know from newspapers that many of us will not have read for many years. Uh, so the individual may not understand the issue. So there may be no concept of what is really going on. There may be a lack of willingness to accept and address and understand the issues that are causing them concern about returning to work. And many people who are experiencing 
the symptoms of anxiety, we'll be looking for the cause. And certainly as an occupational physician, the number of times you come across somebody saying, I don't need treatment, I don't need psychiatry, I don't need psychology, I need my manager, my boss, my colleagues, my ex, whoever else, to stop causing all of my problems. Um, and this is this is a, a very, very common situation that we see. So how do we manage the anxious person returning? Well, first of all, we need to understand the situation. What is causing the problem for the individual at this time? That's where we may need to resort to expert advice and actually to get somebody who really understands the psychiatry or the psychology involved. Define the issues with the agreement of the individual. Try to understand how things are, pre uh, how things are pre presenting and why they're presenting at this time. Looking for adjustments, temporary adjustments can build confidence, can help somebody get back to work and try to ensure that there's an adequate review built into the process. So who's anxious? Well, it's an issue for the individual, for the employee, worker, call them what you like. But there's a degree of concern here for the employer, manager, HR, boss, whoever, trying to provide a safe environment, trying to get people to come back to work. They need to get their companies going. So in short, everybody is worried. Who are we advising? Well, the employee. So it's a what can you do about your situation and how can I advise about your circumstances? We've got the managers and HR. What can you do about the situation? How can you help with individuals and teams? What adjustments are necessary? And then we should be advising organisations and C-suite, senior management. So how should we, the chief medical officer, whoever else in occupational health who is advising, what can we do to help them make it all happen? To do that, it's necessary to discern the nature of the anxiety, the actual cause, the underlying problems that get us to where we are, and therefore have a way to try to make progress. Without an understanding of the situation, we can't possibly offer any meaningful advice. And hopefully the rest of the presentations this afternoon will help us to gain a bit of a better insight into how those anxieties occur. So finally, the picture that we all like to see is the picture of contentment, which is all very rare, but when it's there, you can't help but recognise it. So that's all I have to say for the moment. I will hand back to the central control who hopefully can get the next person on. Thank you. Speak to you later. Great. Hi there, so I'm Nick. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me, Neil, and thanks, Phil, for that introduction uh, to kind of the, the where we're at. Um, let me just kind of share my screen. Um, okay. It's this way, there we go. Um, and what I'm going to do over the next kind of uh, sort of 10, 15 minutes is just give us a little bit of a guided tour around anxiety and to signpost you to a variety of kind of resources that may be helpful at this time as well. Uh, and I think I'd really want to echo Phil's um, kind of message around understanding and understanding what's going on with the anxiety as kind of being key here. Even before the kind of the pandemic hit, um, one of the things that we're aware of is that people have very different uh, kind of levels of kind of risk taking behaviour, the kinds of things that they would engage in, uh, the kinds of things that actually, you know, the bungee jumping or kind of motorcycling, which for many people would make them feel very afraid and they would avoid doing. And we're also aware from, again, also kind of pre-pandemic, um, all the information that we know about anxiety and the kind of fight, flight, freeze response with the impact it has on our kind of physical symptoms. And what we need to bring into the current circumstances is our kind of existing understanding kind of anxiety. And then we need to think about, well, how does it play out in these particular circumstances? One of the ways in which it plays out currently is uh, still, of course, people have de very different uh, gauges of risk and gauges of, what, of what's risky behaviour, whether it be Bournemouth Beach or the kind of the centre of Soho kind of recently. We're all of us living with risk and we're all of us 
somewhere on a continuum between taking lots of risks and taking no risks. And it may be that with the kind of the kind of COVID-19 coming in, that we've changed where we are on this kind of risk continuum. And one of the things that certainly have found helpful kind of prior to the pandemic is really when working with people with anxiety is really kind of just kind of understanding about the kind of the risks that they would take and where would their partners be? Where would good friends be? Do they know people who don't take any risks or people who take lots of risks? And really to kind of understand the context of the kind of like their kind of current behaviour. And now we can think about, well, how has that changed kind of following kind of uh, the, the onset of the kind of the pandemic? The crucial thing to remember, of course, though, this is a perception of risk. Yeah. And it's a perception of risk that leads to lie on this continuum. And understanding this perception can be understood through a kind of a, um, a sort of a, a rough guide to this kind of uh, anxiety, which is that it's proportion to the perception of danger. And that is it's proportion to, uh, proportional to the perceived likelihood that something bad will happen. And we can think about what those uh, bad things might be. But that even if something is very unlikely to happen, people will feel anxious if they think it's the, if this thing happened, it would be particularly awful. So it may be very unlikely that they would die, but if they did, that would be so awful and therefore the anxiety will be higher. And this is offset by the person's perceived coping ability. How well will I be able to kind of uh, do if, if those circumstances arise, but also offset by kind of perceived rescue factors. And that's particularly, you know, what will others do? How will others help or not help? The important thing here is thinking about the perception of all of these things. So it may be that in going into the workplace, people will be concerned about, um, being able to speak up at the meeting, the like the perceived fear is I'm not going to be able to speak up. And what would be so awful about that is that everyone will think I'm stupid and incompetent. Yeah. And the kind of perceived coping for this person is, well, well I, I won't know what to do next. Yeah. That in terms of I'm not going to be able to cope with that situation. And it may be around perceived rescue. Others won't help me out. So if all of those things are kind of almost like at the max, then the anxiety is going to be particularly high. Um, in terms of health anxiety specifically in the current circumstances, people may believe that they're more vulnerable than most people to chest problems. And the awfulness of catching COVID-19 would be that, well, actually, I will die in pain and alone. And that would be awful. But your perception that if this is likely to happen, and this is how awful it will be, of course, the anxiety is going to be higher. And this is offset by the degree to which someone thinks they can cope and offset by perceived rescue factors. And I realise on both these examples, I was almost like sort of non-rescue factors, but actually it can be offset of like, you know, the, the doctors are much more experienced now with kind of COVID-19. They'll be able to kind of help me. I've seen lots of uh, reports in the media where people have been kind of helped. My family will be kind of around me, kind of in spirit, even if they can't be physically. So there's a number of things that we can kind of be thinking about here. And I think this anxiety equation is a good rough guide for trying to help sort of understand people's anxiety. And we really need to ask about each of these different areas, the likelihood, the awfulness, the coping and the rescue. What we also know that, and I think that's true for all anxiety, for anxiety that we all experience, because we know that anxiety is a normal human experience. We know that worry is a normal process. We know that following traumatic events, that having some traumatic stress symptoms are normal in the days and weeks that kind of follow. But what we also know is that most people will recover naturally from traumatic or very stressful experiences. And there's a tricky kind of question here about when do we, when might we intervene? When might we offer some psychological interventions, for example? Um, and really the kind of the guide is um, the, how long have these symptoms lasted? How much do they interfere with a person's life? How upsetting are these symptoms? And really importantly, particularly when we're thinking about traumatic stress reactions, are these symptoms improving? Are they worsening? Or are they kind of sort of remaining kind of stable? And of course, if there's a kind of worsening course, if these are interfering with somebody's life, then of course we would want to kind of offer some intervention. But this is actually still on a continuum, whether or not we kind of can apply diagnostic labels and kind of particular anxiety disorders. What we're really thinking about is how are these affecting people's lives? How are they stopping them living the life that they want? 
So what does the evidence show in the current current circumstances in the UK? Um, so there's a kind of a thinking about anxiety disorders. Uh, this is a kind of preprint and with preprints, we need to kind of just uh, hold it hasn't been through the peer review process yet. But this is the probably the largest uh, kind of sort of study that's kind of coming uh, that which which is longitudinal because it has um, the kind of the population from pre COVID as well. So this is the kind of in Bristol, the Avon Longitudinal Study and also uh, the Scottish Family Health Study. And what this longitudinal cohort study with thousands in each of these uh, studies is showing that actually, broadly speaking, anxiety is higher, well-being is lower, but the levels of depression are similar and probable anxiety disorder uh, kind of diagnosis uh, have nearly doubled during this kind of uh, initial kind of period of COVID-19. One of the interesting things uh, that this longitudinal study is showing is with uh, at this point with the preprint there's no evidence of elevate, elevated risk for key workers or health workers over and above other kind of people in the population and the kind of the other risk factors are, are kind of there on the slide. So if we're thinking about kind of uh, identifying anxiety disorders and offering kind of treatment for anxiety disorders um, I think first we also need to consider you know Given that anxiety uh, is a normal process, given that kind of worry and anxiety are reported by most people, we do need to consider actually, is this a primary mood problem? Is it perhaps kind of PTSD? And I highlight that because this is one of the kind of diagnoses that is particularly kind of missed. And we really need to kind of ask about kind of re experiencing symptoms. If people are talking about kind of worry and anxiety and feeling scared, we need to kind of sort of check out what the context of that is rather than just taking a well, this is anxiety as a, as a whole. OK, so assuming that it is kind of uh, anxiety, it is an anxiety kind of disorder that needs to kind of treatment. Uh, what NICE recommends across all kind of anxiety problems is that cognitive behaviour therapy is the kind of the treatment of choice. And the key part of cognitive behaviour therapy is actually having a shared understanding. So it goes back to what Phil said about understand the anxiety. This is the kind of the formulation to really kind of understand what's keeping the problem going. And actually the formulation, the understanding is a key part of treatment because it's giving people a different sort of way of making sense of their experiences. So if, when developing the understanding with people, we need to make sure we're getting kind of feedback and summaries from patients. We're not just kind of telling them how it is, because actually by telling people without getting that feedback, we know that that's going to be kind of misinterpreted and what we want to identify are what are the key threats what are the key meanings and that goes back to the kind of that anxiety equation and what are the key maintaining processes and i'll show some of those on the kind of the next slide and i think two of the key elements of any kind of cbt treatments are firstly providing information about anxiety about circumstances the kind of the development of the formulation and then helping people to overcome avoidance um, and of course, one of the difficulties that kind of Phil also kind of mentioned in his talk was that actually avoidance is culturally sanctioned at the moment. So this is uh, uh, the second sort of rough guide to anxiety that I'll share with you, uh, sometimes referred to as the kind of vicious flower. Uh, I'm not going to go through it in great detail, but uh, one of the things I just want to highlight is that actually at the heart of the kind of cognitive behavioural treatment of anxiety is that kind of sense of meaning, the threat appraisal. And that's that anxiety equation that I kind of showed earlier. And that's maintained by a range of different kind of um, processes. The main one typically kind of being avoidance, but there are other kind of uh, processes that are important there as well. And if we can understand people's worst fears and understand some of these key processes, then we can kind of work with them to kind of to change these things. I said that one of the key things we're doing is providing information, and I think that's true. One of the things that we may as health professionals sometimes fall into the trap of is that when people are feeling anxious, we're just going to tell them that everything's going to be all right. Yeah, this is the son's anti-paranoia card. But what we're trying to provide is providing information, not continual reassurance, particularly for kind of the chronic anxiety problems. Um, and if we take health anxiety as uh, a case in point, there are two kind of key elements really to kind of health anxiety, one of which is kind of like disease phobia, the kind of the fear of uh, catching or that you have caught the kind of uh, the disease. 
and that this is kind of very high in the kind of current kind of COVID-19 situation. And then there's the kind of the disease conviction, the kind of how convinced you are that you do in fact have it. And one of the things that we know that this is going to be limited to some degree by the time scale of, of the uh, virus and uh, how quickly you may become well or how quickly some of the sensations will pass. In health anxiety, the crucial kind of uh, meaning, the crucial kind of threat appraisal is a misinterpretation of physical symptoms. Yeah, that, that you're having particular symptoms such as kind of uh, breathlessness and that you believe that either that there's something going seriously wrong with you at that moment right now or that this is a sign of kind of COVID-19. And also misinterpreting, misinterpreting rather um, medical information that's provided either from the media or also kind of from health professionals. And this is one of the reasons to always check out what somebody's understanding is rather than uh, kind of assuming that. And that health anxiety is probably the uh, kind of particular form of anxiety where reassurance seeking from health professionals is kind of at its kind of strongest. And we need to be wary of continuing saying to people, actually, you're OK. Yeah. And that's probably more relevant in kind of health anxiety associated with other uh, kind of physical health concerns. Um, if you're particularly uh, wanting to get more information about kind of health anxiety, I would highly recommend uh, a kind of a, a 90 minute webinar that's uh, freely available um, uh, from uh, kind of very eminent uh, psychologists looking at kind of health anxiety specifically uh, about the understanding of and kind of treatment in the current circumstances. Um, the last thing that I wanted to kind of sort of signpost around kind of anxiety is a recent paper actually around death anxiety. So we've got health anxiety, but death anxiety. Um, and this is uh, in uh, free to access in the Cognitive Behaviour Therapist. It was kind of published just in the last few weeks. And it's really building on a kind of a, a quite an old um, uh, anthropological kind of uh, theory, uh, which kind of says that if we're aware of our own death or the possibility of death, this will cause terror for us. And that this is kind of buffered by two kind of sets of uh, processes. One is a kind of a cultural worldview, such as a belief in an afterlife. And one is the other is kind of a sense of self-esteem that kind of you're a valuable member of your kind of kind of group who will be remembered after your death. And those things tend to allay the fear of death. And when there are reminders of death, as there currently are in uh, the kind of the pandemic, this will kind of produce increases in attempts to avoid death, of course, and that may be self-isolating, maybe kind of wearing kind of more kind of protective gear than is kind of recommended, um, but also uh, it will increase attempts to kind of ensure this kind of, kind of symbolic, so there's symbolic immortality, like really kind of uh, coming into your particular cultural group and just kind of hunkering down with your particular cultural group. The implications clinically for us of thinking around death anxiety and this being a process that may be one of the processes that underlies a number of kind of anxiety conditions, panic disorder, health anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, is that there we may need to get into the detail of understanding what the person's specific thoughts about death are. And there's a range of kind of options on the slide that you can see there. And that typically treatment is around focusing on the cost of death rather than the likelihood. What's the worst thing about the um, the very worst thing for you personally. And this is where, we're, again, we need to come back to the understanding of personal meanings. And that the treatments that are most effective at kind of helping people with uh, both health anxiety and death anxiety are cognitive behavioural treatments, which are aimed at these meanings and the process of overcoming avoidance. So given that avoidance is key and a key symptom of anxiety, distressed staff who have anxiety may well be staying work, uh, away from work. And one of the things that we need to be considering that if staff aren't at work, is it related to worry, stress, anxiety? Yeah, that should be one of the things that we're immediately kind of considering. And really kind of advice for, uh, for staff in workplaces, staff for, for advice for clients, advice for us all, is that typically we want to try and rely on trusted sources of information. Uh, and recognise that people with anxiety will misinterpret this. We want to perhaps limit our exposure to kind of to news and media reporting and actually stick to what the known facts are as from these kind of trusted sources of information. 
we should recognise that we may have acute levels of stress in response to particular circumstances and to normalise that, but to be aware that that is different from kind of a chronic anxiety problem. And then finally, if people are developing chronic anxiety problems, then actually psychological interventions that work are available. And in this country, they're most common, in England rather, they're most commonly available in the improving access to psychological therapy services. So for um, final shot for kind of like healthcare workers, for ourselves, looking after ourselves, um, the um, uh, NHS uh, England and Improvement uh, do have uh, support systems in place and that actually for all of us working in the NHS, we go to people.nhs.uk. There's a kind of uh, guide you around all of the things where we psychologists, psychiatrists, other professionals can also look after ourselves so that our own anxiety isn't going to impact on the people that we're helping. And some further contact details if interested. So thank you. And uh, I'm going to pass over to Dan. OK, I think I'm up. I'm just going to share my desktop uh, or attempt to. So hopefully you can see this. Uh, so um, I'm uh, flattered to have been invited today to talk about functional impairment uh, associated with COVID related anxiety symptoms. You'll notice that that is a different title to the one that was advertised. Um, that is because this is my interpretation of the title that was advertised, which um, I didn't fully understand. It, it sort of it doesn't seem to make any grammatical sense in my head, but I think that's just me. The reason I'm saying this is that if I don't cover what you have expected me to cover, um, that's what the Q&A session is for. And hopefully I'll be able to uh, shed some light on, on things that come up. Um, I do work for uh, the Defence Medical Rehabilitation Centre, but I'm here representing myself uh, and not the MOD. Um, so views are my own, uh, as will be any uh, controversy or any complete abject nonsense that uh, comes up over the course of this presentation. Um, so to help me uh, put my thoughts in order, um, when thinking about uh, the sorts of people that will experience uh, functional impairment and anxiety within the workplace. Um, I thought I'd really go back to um, what Phil was talking about, which is, you know, who are these people who are going to get anxiety? And very briefly, um, I've summarised them into the following categories, really. Um, people who have recovered from any severity uh, of COVID-19 infection um, are going to be worried about the longer term effects of that illness um, because we don't know what they will be uh, and we're getting conflicted uh, and sometimes uh, sensationalist reporting uh, about what those longer term uh, effects could possibly be. There will be people who have had a traumatic experience linked to uh, the pandemic, uh, people who have required critical care uh, for treatment of COVID, but also, of course, the frontline workers um, and essential uh, essential workers, so supermarket staff, people who work uh, on public transport, uh, NHS workers and the police, of course. Um, there are, of course, uh, people who have pre-existing medical vulnerabilities, uh, the shielders, um, who are going to be particularly worried about um, their health should they contract uh, COVID-19. Um, there are people who have uh, an increased vulnerability to anxiety. So people who were already being treated for an anxiety disorder prior to the pandemic or people who have a uh, past psychiatric history uh, that makes them more likely to develop anxiety symptoms uh, in response to unpredictable stresses and unpredictably stressful situations. Uh, and then there are groups of people um, who will uh, perhaps struggle more, uh, people who already had health anxiety, uh, people with uh, conditions such as obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, who have obsessional thoughts about contamination, illness. Um, I 
don't think they are having a particularly good time um, uh, during this pandemic. And finally, there's the understandably worried well, because these are uh, uncertain times. Um, people are going to be worried about uh, changing uncertainty, um, the uh, health of relatives and loved ones, and um, there will be a group of people who have symptoms of anxiety who are not necessarily ill, they don't have an anxiety disorder, but their anxiety symptoms are impairing in some way, and it's important to think about those people as well. So, um, how does anxiety affect your functioning in the workplace? And um, these are the headings that I've come up with. I think that anxiety affects your ability to work effectively. Um, it can affect your ability to work independently. Um, people who are anxious may struggle to work with others. Um, it can affect uh, how you engage in safety critical tasks. And for a proportion of people with anxiety, um, it can actually prevent one from working at all. So the, the functional impact of anxiety can be really very significant. Um, so how does anxiety affect your ability to work effectively? So if you're going to work effectively, you need to be able to make decisions and prioritise tasks, uh, utilising time management strategies, um, and you need to have sufficient stamina uh, to respond to the rigours of a full shift. Um, so we know that symptoms that come along with anxiety include uh, excessive worry, autonomic hyperarousal, sleep disturbance, and these can all uh, influence your decision making ability um, through uh, fatigue and distractibility. Um, anxiety can um, affect people's abilities to focus upon instructions uh, and people with anxiety will often report a subject memory impairment um, which uh, is usually attributable to an individual being distracted by their worrying thoughts. Um, the symptoms of anxiety that I've already mentioned uh, can affect people's ability to work at pace or manage their time. Um, I think it is plausible that people with uh, COVID related anxiety may develop safety behaviours um, such as excessive hand washing, particular PPE rituals. Um, they may change the way that they travel to and from work um, and this can interfere with task completion. Um, and, uh, and I think that your ability to prioritise tasks and manage your time uh, can be particularly impaired uh, if you are somebody who is having obsessional thoughts as part of your anxiety presentation. Of course, you don't need to have OCD, of course, to have obsessional thoughts. Stamina is going to be affected by fatigue um, and the impact of um, lengthy avoidance behaviours. So if somebody uh, is taking an unusually lengthy route to and from work to avoid public transport or to avoid uh, crowded uh, rush hour traffic, um, they may find that they have less time to rest and recuperate outside of work. And efficient working can also be uh, affected by the somatic symptoms of anxiety. So if somebody has GI disturbance or urinary frequency, uh, you may find that they require more rest breaks than their colleagues, uh, which could have considerable impact uh, if rest facilities are not easily accessible. Right. Um, anxiety affecting the ability to work independently. Uh, to work independently, of course, you need to be able to work effectively, which is the, the previous slide. Um, but also um, individuals who uh, are working in isolation uh, or with minimal supervision may be removed from important peer support mechanisms. Um, so before we started this uh, webinar, um, we were setting things up and, and Liz, who's doing all the technical things, um, she's entirely by herself in the uh, Royal College building in London. Um, now, some people with 
stressful. I love being entirely by myself. Great. Uh, but some people will find that entirely intolerable. And if you're already anxious and you're in a situation that under ordinary circumstances you find uncomfortable, um, that can uh, heighten your anxiety. Uh, and I believe that uh, somebody who is struggling to work in isolation or without peer support may find themselves distracted by um, recurring worrying thoughts, worry, uh, becoming uh, really unmanageable for them. I think we also need to remember that managers may feel a considerable personal responsibility towards the health and safety of their team, um, and they are often individuals who uh, need to work independently. So it's important that we're alert uh, to symptoms of anxiety or general distress uh, in employees who are working with minimal supervision or support. But also um, anxiety symptoms can affect one's ability to work with other people. Um, to work with other people, um, you need to uh, be able to tolerate frustration and relinquish some degree of control over your own working pattern and also tolerate noise. Um, so the hyper arousal component of anxiety is associated with irritability uh, and sensitivity to noise. Um, and I think that employers need to be able to consider uh, the impact of an individual who is um, having irritable outbursts frequently uh, in, a, in a workplace situation, uh, they need to consider what impact that is going to have uh, upon team cohesion and morale. Um, it may be possible, of course, to modify the working environment for people who struggle with hyper arousal when there are too many people around, uh, perhaps assigning them to uh, quieter locations or giving them some degree of control over their working pattern perhaps uh, allowing them to uh, remove themselves from situations that might have otherwise provoked uh, an, an emotional outburst. But, you know, being unable to work with other people, uh, I'm sure you'd agree, is quite uh, a substantial uh, functional impairment associated with anxiety. OK, safe working uh, also affected by anxiety. Back to being able to work effectively. If you can't work effectively, um, you will struggle to work uh, safely. Um, an individual who is fatigued, hyper aroused and preoccupied with worry uh, is more likely to make mistakes. Um, this doesn't mean that they are uh, unable to work entirely, um, but you need to give consideration to uh, their ability to engage in safety critical tasks. Of course, removing too much responsibility from an individual might make the job boring or understimulating, which also increases the uh, risk of making mistakes. So there is a, a bit of a balancing act here um, uh, to be considered for employers. Um, you also need to be able to work predictably. And what I really mean by this is that your anxiety symptoms need to be predictable, particularly uh, if you're experiencing uh, uh, so panic can be uh, completely incapacitating for a patient. In fact, it can inca incapacitate uh, the people around the individual who drop what they're doing to attend to the, uh, the person who is having the panic episode. Uh, now, some people who experience panic experience panic very predictably. There's always a clear uh, trigger for that panic, uh, which you can account for within the workplace. You can limit uh, the individual's um, sort of exposure to that particular trigger. Um, and if you can actually limit, el eliminate that trigger entirely, um, those people might not experience panic within the workplace at all. But there's another group of people who experience panic uh, through a variety of triggers with no clear pattern to it. Um, and I would be really concerned about the possibility of a panic attack arising while they're operating uh, heavy machinery, uh, for instance. 
so uh, extreme that they uh, have that depersonalization or derealization element. Now, in my experience, when I've worked with people who uh, have panic symptoms and I have expressed concerns about how that impacts their ability to do their job, um, what they invariably tell me um, is when I'm operating that piece of equipment, um, I'm completely fine. I never have any panic whatsoever. Um, you know, please don't take away my currency to uh, operate uh, that lifter or to fly in an aircraft. Uh, this is what I enjoy doing. Um, you know, you have to allow me to keep doing that. Uh, and of course, I can't do that. You know, that that would be something um, that is uh, not very sensible for me to to um, to just give a, a pass for. Um, however, the patient might be right. Um, it might be that uh, being completely focused on a very practical task um, does prevent symptoms of panic. It does prevent the, the sort of intrusion of those worrying thoughts. Um, so my advice would be to get an occupational report um, or do a workplace assessment uh, or get corroborating eyewitness accounts of, of these episodes of panic from other people, uh, which can uh, help you as the clinician to feel more confident uh, to allow people to sort of re-engage in these safety critical activities, perhaps in a, a graded or supervised uh, manner at the start. So uh, safe working. And the final uh, heading was uh, people being prevented from working at all uh, through anxiety. Uh, first bullet is the same as, <laughs> as the other ones really, you've got to be able to work effectively uh, to work at all. Um, working predictably against because having very frequent and unpredictable episodes of panic during the day. Um, it might be very difficult actually for uh, an employer uh, to be able to find a working arrangement that um, allows for those panic episodes and, and controls them. Um, we would try, uh, but it would be very difficult. Um, but you also have to be able to leave the house if required to um, travel to uh, your place of work. And I, I think that the, the conditions of uh, this pandemic uh, seem ideally suited to provoke an agoraphobic response, really. Um, we are told that we're less safe out of doors. We're told that we're particularly unsafe uh, in crowded places. Um, there is um, every nation has had its own response uh, to controlling the um, the outbreak, uh, and there is considerable considerable debate about which response is correct. There's a lot of uncertainty, um, and um, there's a lot of things to avoid, really, I think. Um, so if you consider the avoidance uh, component of anxiety in COVID related anxiety, um, triggers for anxiety could be anything at all. Um, being out of doors, not being able to go out because you can't see uh, your family, uh, traveling to or from work could uh, heighten your anxiety, uh, interacting with others could heighten your anxiety, not having any interaction with others could heighten your anxiety. That There are a lot of elements um, uh, that might be included in an avoidance response, um, which would uh, really substantially impair somebody's ability to work. Um, and you need to be able to feel well enough to work. So um, again, back to what Phil was saying, um, some people will say that they just don't feel well enough to go back to work and, um, and it might be our job to unpick that. Uh, but there'll be a group within uh, that category of people who are having prominent somatic symptoms of anxiety, so GI disturbance, cardiac symptoms, respiratory symptoms, and they might feel that they contracted COVID and nobody has spotted it uh, because, um, you know, not everybody's had access to tests. And they don't agree with the result and uh, they have become worried about uh, what the longer term impact of having uh, had what they believe was a COVID infection uh, will be on their ability to do their job, their safety to, to interact with other people. Um, I think that it is plausible that there will be a, a higher preponderance of workplace absences um, as lockdown lifts. Um, 
um, certainly in the early stages of work. Um, and if so, uh, I think that that will have an impact potentially uh, on the morale and um, psychological uh, well-being of the reduced workforce uh, and increasing the likelihood of occupational burnout. I just have a final slide, really, which I will um, fly through um, uh, just just because of time um, but these were these would be the general things that i would consider when assessing fitness to work and, and it's not um not to really repeat what phil has said and, and that's why i'm going to fly through it but you know you've got to consider environment uh, stress attached to the role uh, level of supervision and peer report um, does the individual engage in safety critical tasks and um, what's the individual's vulnerability uh, to uh, worsening symptoms of both physical and mental illnesses, uh, the impact of that illness upon the rest of the workforce um, and the individual's insight into their diagnosis. So that is all from me really, and I'll, I'll hand back uh, to Neil. Thank you very much indeed to all the speakers um, for three really um, entertaining, in my view, uh, and informative uh, presentations. Um, I put up there um, three Twitter handles. So that's uh, for the uh, RSIG, um, for myself and also for Nick, um, Dan and Phil Ray sent to me decided to stay off Twitter. Uh, but if you decide to follow uh, us three, then we can definitely pump out uh, any relevant information as it comes out. <laughs> Um, now, we've had a, a few questions um, come in, which I'm pleased uh, to say. Um, and one of them, um, which I'll, I'll put open to anybody, is uh, from an individual who um, has some disabilities and actually has quite, I think, enjoyed uh, the last few months because actually they've been working pretty much like anybody else uh, remotely. Um, but now they're being asked to come back to the workplace. Uh, and so this is perhaps a sort of sh a, a, a slightly unusual way of looking at it, but a really important one is is what sort of advice might we give both individuals but also employers um, in terms of bringing people back to the workplace who might have disabilities who actually might find coming back to the workplace sort of disrupts their, their last few good months so any any of the three Sh thinkers? Sh shall i leap in there um i think the first question we've got to ask generally in respect of people coming back is what have we learned about people's work, the way they work and how effective they are over the last few months and how that should change things going forward. So in this particular situation, it may well be that there's a sensible adjustment to be made here. We have to always have a balance between working lonely, uh, alone and lonely and, and actually being in a workplace. There's always a balance to be struck. No one solution is right, but I think there's a lot to be learned here. The other thing I think is to be very careful about assuming that because you have a particular set of disabilities or difficulties that you are at increased risk. Um, I mentioned the COVID age um, uh, um, uh, calculation. Look at the Alamo website, alamo.org.uk, uh, and you'll see where we can stratify increased risk for particular medical conditions in relation to COVID. COVID. That can be reassuring for people. Thank you, Phil. Um, Nick, Dan, do you have any comments to make on that one? Um, I, I think the one thing that I would add is that um, I feel we've all accepted um, that the ways in which we work will now have changed um, and there's an opportunity for every employer uh, to review working practices generally um, and you know, to employers, uh, my advice would be uh, that as people are returning to work, this is a fantastic opportunity for employers to explore their employees' expectations of what a return to work would look like, uh, because everybody's expectations are going to be different. Some people are chomping at the bit to get back to work, uh, and some people think it would be the worst thing ever. Um, and actually, with the new flexible ways of working that there may be, um, we may be able to incorporate both uh, groups of people um, and, uh, and prioritise in office working for people who want to be in and home working for people who don't. So that, that would be my uh, comment really on that. Thank you very much indeed. 
Um, next question, which I'll put to Nick, so just to put you on, on watch, is, is, a, is about um, about shielding. So this was about touching on people coming back from shielding. And the reason that I'd quite like if you feel able to, to answer it would be that the, so the question is, is that you, you really helpfully talked about what someone's perception and that we shouldn't just reassure them it will all be OK and we should use information. From an employer's point of view, how does how do you think an employer should balance, you know, what what is known about shielding these are vulnerable people versus also the government's now saying, you know, come back to work on the 1st of August, it'll all be OK. Um, you know, accepting you're not a shielding expert, but on the, managing the anxiety around that. Would you have any any thoughts on that? I mean, the one thing I would say is that, of course, the um, what appears to me to be the sometimes not entirely clear communications that come from different official sources doesn't help anybody with anxiety, particularly when we're then trying to, I'm, I'm saying, you know, let's go with what the kind of uh, best evidence is, what the kind of the official line is. If there isn't a, a well-held official line, then I've got to say, I would be looking at it on an individual basis with that client um, in that kind of particular workplace from what the range of information is and how can we together understand that information. One of the things we do know is that people with anxiety will overestimate how likely something is and they will uh, overestimate how awful something would be. Um, so I'm not saying that they're wrong. What I'm saying is that kind of we need to explore together with them. We may decide together with them. Actually, yeah, they're right. And, and it wouldn't be the right. The right thing to do would not be to come back to this particular setting at this particular time. OK, thank you. I, I think I think that's that, that that that's very useful. And I guess um, one last question, because we've only got a, a couple of minutes is is um, for people who have found this uh, period particularly difficult and who actually might be looking forward to coming back to work <laughs> rather than actually not looking forward to it. Um, is there anything that employers perhaps should think about about the overly enthusiastic uh, returnee? Um, who perhaps is not anxious enough in some ways. It might, um, is there any way that a, a, a manager might be able to, to spot them, someone who might be underplaying risks, um, you know, maybe even underplaying the fact they might have COVID because they're so keen to come back to work? Is, is there any advice there? Yeah, that's the... the... You're, 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 you're off your mute, Phil. You're quite right. You're quite correct. The difficult question of presenteeism. Um, I think this is this is a universal question. It's not just a, a COVID one. It's one we've wrestled with for a long time. Uh, I think that 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 um, uh, employers have to rely on their occupational health services to assist in these situations. And I think it's important to try to understand, as I think we've all said at different times, what somebody's motivations for being somewhere are. Um, in particular, when it comes to the uh, people who are taking unreasonable risks, people who are known to have um, serious underlying conditions that put them at, at great risk, who don't appear to be taking uh, a great deal of notice. And I think we've sadly seen some situations in the health service where people who were at high risk thought it was more important for them to be at the front line doing their job and, and it hasn't always gone well. So there are some serious and difficult decisions to be taken. Employment law is not very helpful in this circumstance, but we really don't have time to do that today. Can I just add one comment quickly yeah. now, um, which is I'd go back to the kind of the slide I put up with a kind of a continuum of risk taking. And one of the things that's helpful about that when working with people is that people can see that actually there are people who are perhaps more likely to take uh, the kinds of risks that are unhelpful, not just to themselves, but maybe to the kind of wider population as well. Um, and, and actually having that as a, this is a normal continuum, we just need to think about for some people, we're trying to move them up to take a few more risks to overcome their anxiety. For other people, we might be trying to help them to move slightly down the continuum so they're not putting others at risk. Absolutely. I think that's really useful. Well, listen, thank you all very much for all three excellent speakers. And I also have to say a really big thank you to Catherine and Liz, who you might not be able to see, but we wouldn't have been able to run this without their excellent help uh, in the background. Um, I hope you found that useful. The slides um, will hopefully be available uh, and I believe it's been recorded. Um, thank you for listening. Um, do have a look at our SIG website, which is on the Royal College of Psychiatrists website. Uh, and we hope to hold uh, more presentations um, next time, hopefully face to face with a glass of wine to follow. So thank you very much indeed for all your all your time. Bye bye.